Hi, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to the Finding You podcast. My name is Dr. Brad Reedy. Today is Tuesday, October 1st, 2024. Tonight, I thought I would talk about not necessarily the products that we're offering at Finding You, but I want to introduce you all to Finding You and our philosophy. So that if you're new listening to this podcast, then, then this will be an introduction to all of my work. If you've been listening to us as we've been working under the Evoke logo, the Evoke brand, then you're finding this in the same place, but you're hearing about the, the maybe the small and subtle changes in the way that I talk about our programming and, and our therapy and our, and our coaching. So for all of you to be clear, anything finding you, anything you want to find out, if you want to register for an intensive, if you want to find a coach, we'll have workshops coming up. You can reach us for now at drbradreedy at gmail.com. That's D-R-B-R-A-D-R-E-E-D-Y at gmail.com. Or you can go to drbradreedy.com. By the end of the week, we'll have a new website with new email addresses, but we're operating with what we have right now. So let me get into tonight's broadcast and talk about the philosophy, the, the, the things, the ideas, the sensibility that underlies all of the work that we do. I like this quote, your relationships give you the opportunity to grow and challenge you, to examine the issues left over from your own childhood. If you approach such challenges as a burden, Relationships can become an unpleasant chore. If, on the other hand, you try to see these moments as learning opportunities, then you can continue to grow and develop. So when we come up, we believe, when we come up against a challenge in a relationship, and, and I'm going to expand the finding you messaging beyond parenting because so many of the people that, that come here, while they might find their entry into this work through the child that, 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 that might be struggling, what they find of these relationships help all of their relationships. So all of these relationships begin to expose parts of yourself that are things that you haven't developed, things that you haven't examined, things that you've been avoiding and bearing. So, you know, when I'm talking to somebody who's deciding about an important decision in a marriage or a divorce or a breakup or to, to commit to somebody, let alone parenting or other, other, other relationship, I always say to them, it doesn't really matter which decision you make. The work is the same either way. And, and in many cases, what I believe is the relationship, if you stay in the relationship, uh, the relationship then gives you the opportunity, really really exposes the parts of yourself that you need to work on. So that's the fundamental idea of finding you. That's why we call it finding you, because that is the basis for everything else. James Hall has said, the truth about intimate relationships is that they can never be any better than our relationship that we have with ourselves. This is a core tenet. If you're considering an intensive, a couple's intensive, or a family's intensive, you'll probably hear somebody from our enrollment department talk about the idea of going to a finding you first. This idea that the foundational, the fundamental work is the relationship that we have with ourselves, And then from there, you start to treat and recognize that people are more like you than they are different that what your child might be struggling with might look differently, might look different than what you're struggling with, but they essentially need the same thing. Somebody asked me just this week in a one-on-one -on -one session about my own journey, uh, going through this, discovering what I'm sharing with you today. And I said to them, when I came to a point in my life where everything that I was trying, everything that I was up against felt like an utter failure. It was that moment that I, that I surrendered, that I accepted, that I, that I couldn't get it right. And in that, I would say, dark place, I know what I needed from those around me. When I was interacting with friends, with my close family members, and they were talking to me, I, I knew that I needed love. I knew that I needed support. I knew that I needed kindness and non-judgment. I knew that I didn't need simple, trite advice, and the list went on. And as I made it through this, this dark period in my life, what became obvious to me, that's what other people need also. So, so the thing that I discovered about myself is virtually, basically, universally true for everybody else. And that is what this work does to you. You start to connect to your authentic self in ways that you never have before because you have to look at your life differently. You have to ask yourself different questions. At least you have to challenge the answers that you've been accepting up to this point. And if you're lucky enough to find what you really need, then it becomes clear to you that other people need the same thing. They need grace. They need compassion. They need listening more than they do advice or lectures. And that becomes obvious and apparent. 
people write to me, they call me, they meet with me in my one-on-one -on -one sessions to ask me the questions, what should I do? What should I do with my child? What should I do with my marriage? What should I do with my family or this big life decision that's in front of me? And in all of my years of studying, all of my years, not just of reading, that's not the kind of studying that I'm referring to, but studying and listen to families and individuals. And in all of those years, working as a therapist and going to therapy myself, I've come to the conclusion that the best thing you can do is to work on yourself. I'm going to talk about that in, in a very specific way tonight. That really means to come to know yourself and then to be that person in the world. And the path to do that, the path to find yourself, become yourself, and then find some of the courage to, to be that in the world, regardless of consequences, often runs through this process of spending enough time with somebody else who looks at you compassionately, who looks at you with understanding and curiosity and love. See, self-awareness, self-consciousness, understanding who you are starts with the fact that you have to love yourself because the parts of yourself that you're going to discover are parts of yourself that you have been taught to hate. Parts of yourself that you have been taught were useless, were, were unacceptable. So the first ingredient in this potion, if you will, to self-awareness, to consciousness, is self-love. So where do you develop that? How do you develop that? There are more than, there's more than one way to develop that, I'm sure. But my experience as a psychotherapist is that you spend time around somebody who sees you differently, who sees you differently than your parents, than your context, than your teachers, than your siblings and the peers that you've been spending time with. It's, it's, a, it's a miracle to realize this idea that what we think about ourselves, we imagine that came from us. We have no experience of the imprinting that happens to us, the, the programming, the conditioning that happens to us. I love the quote that I read many years ago that says a child that is abused by a parent doesn't stop loving the parent, it stops loving itself. We become, in essence, what are, are the big people around us in critical developmental phases thought of us and felt about us. If they were worried about us, we thought something was wrong about us. If they were frustrated, upset, disappointed in us, again, we thought something was wrong with us. We did not have the wherewithal, developmentally speaking, we did not have the brain development, the consciousness, the, the, the ego strength to realize that's about my mother, my father, my teacher, my, my siblings, my older siblings. We just began to internalize that as an idea of self-image. Then we go out into the world struggling with this, this partial, this limited self-image that we have gained in this process. And then we try to make our way. We build defenses against being seen as we are because we've been told that if we are seen as we are, it will be absolutely unacceptable. Through the process of treating children, I have learned that the plight of, I have learned about the plight of parents in raising them. While their stories are often heart-wrenching, their appeals for help are often met with judgment, dogma, and so-called experts selling them the next great thing in parenting education, which invariably, of course, contradicts the last expert. I soon realized that dispensing advice is not the most effective model for encouraging effective parenting. It's unsustainable and it doesn't perpetuate growth in the client. If a therapist gave me specific advice, I could blame her when it failed or caused me difficulty. Indeed, I have heard parents blame other therapists, experts, programs, and yes, me for their lack of success in parenting. Let me be clear. Therapists are not the experts on your life but rather their expertise is in creating a container or experience in which you can discover your truth. An effective container is a place in the mind of the therapist. Ideally for children, it's the mind of the parent. The cycle of ask, ask the expert, get the advice, follow the advice, and blame the expert removes any ownership by the parents for their results. In addition, parents often complain about divergent expert opinions contributing to their own lack of clarity hope and confidence. The key in this equation is that you have to make your own choices. Nobody can live your life for you. And then you get to own them and live with them and live with the consequences. So what is the work? I talk about that all the time. I've done a podcast on what is the work, but I'm going to talk about it a little bit differently tonight. 
I want to tell you first what the work is not. The work is not, in a way, getting better. The work results in getting better, but that's not the work. So often when I'm working with a client in a, in a group setting or in a one-on-one -on -one session, the idea that they have, that they, that they glean from the dialogue is, oh, I need to do better with that. I need to be more patient with my spouse. I need to be clearer with my children. I need to have better boundaries with my siblings or my parents or, or the folks that I work with. And I always invite them to slow down. Because, first of all, if you think that the, the idea in the work is just to get better and to improve, you're going to be walking a razor's edge, right? The, 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 the consequences are, are shame and guilt because this is laborious work. This is difficult work. It takes time. And, and, and the, the, the one possible outcome that happens when people think about the work as getting better is after a short period of time, they can only tolerate so much and they imagine that they've conquered this idea, that they've climbed to this next level on the mountaintop on their rise. And then they don't see, they, they go back into denial. They don't see the parts of themselves. Psychotherapy in a very real sense is being able to see yourself as you are. And that is really, really difficult. So don't think about it in terms of getting better or improving. It's not a, it's not a self-improvement project. It's a self-compassion project, which by the way, then leads to improvement naturally. It's not a skill or a tool, although those help and assist and give some shape and structure to what you're doing. But principally it is the, the, the outcome of the work is not what you get, but who you become, how you feel. And that, of course, those things change everything. It's not about improving yourself, although the work does improve you. But again, if you think about, like I told the story before, when I had a friend, a colleague say to me after a discussion about her own codependency. She asked me if I, if I saw codependency in her. And she was asking it in a very safe way, very safe space. And I said, yes, of course, I see some of it in you. It's, it's virtually in everybody. And she said, do you think my family see my codependence. And I said, I'm imagining that they do. And I gave her some examples with some of the dialogues that she had shared with me in our recent sessions of supervision. And she said to me, half jokingly, half seriously, she said, but I don't want to be codependent today. I don't want to be codependent anymore, she said to me. And I said, you don't have that option today. That particular choice is not on the menu. The only thing you could do is to realize that you are that, whatever that is, in this case, codependency. Look at it, you know, spend some time with it, understand it slowly, gently through a compassionate process, unravel it, see how it's benefited you. And over time, this, this compassionate inquiry, as some people call it, leads to this subtle transformation over time. It's not about being your best self. Like I told you, somebody reached out to me to, to develop an app and said, uh, they used the word favorite self. They said, they said to me, I don't like the idea of your best self. I think they could sense the, the obvious judgment in that word. They said, I like the idea of a favorite self. And I said, what if it was the authentic self? What if the goal was to become your real self in this process? And they liked that, of course, because that is something that we can take, take small incremental steps toward. It's not about being good. It's not about being right. It's not about coming on, on, out on top. It's not about having the perfect skill set. See, in relationship, as I've experienced small, painstaking, difficult growth over my life, what I've realized is the more that I know myself, and, and that means... Uh, not the pretty parts, not the talented parts or successful parts, but all the parts. The more I know myself, and again, by knowing myself, I've developed compassion or else I couldn't see them. If I don't have compassion, if I don't have self-love self, self -love and self-compassion, I won't see myself honestly. But as I've learned to know myself, then when I make a misstep in a relationship, when I react out of, out of a defense, out of hurt, out of fear, I can say to my wife, I can say to my children, 
I can say those around me more easily. I'm sorry. This is what I did. That old idea that once you accept yourself, nobody can use it against you. But if the project is to be good, if the project is to be right, to not make a mistake, even if the project is simply to improve, the defense is needed. The defense is that protective wall that keeps people from seeing us because who we are is unacceptable to us, to us. It's important, Siegel and Hartzell say in Parenting from the Inside Out, they say it's important to take responsibility for one's own actions, not to condemn ourselves because we are not able to act in some idealized manner or because we are, we are not further along in our own devel developmental process. The idea in this work is self-acceptance. And, and when I'm around people who follow my work casually, I can sense sometimes this idea, whether it's directed at themselves or even directed at me about being gooder, being better. And, and that the pressure that that puts on one. But the fact of the matter is the best I can do is to be myself, to be my horrible rotten self. The work means understanding your childhood and its impact on you. Sometimes I hear therapists talk about this idea or really clients talk about this idea that they've met with other therapists who think it's a waste of time to go back and look at your childhood. And, and, and I can imagine other models see it this way. And if that works for them, wonderful. If that works for you, wonderful. That is not the work of finding you, finding you therapy programs. The work is understanding it. At critical developmental neurological stages in our life, the environment had its way with us positively and negatively and everything in between. We became shaped in a certain way. We had certain relationships with feelings like anger and sadness, events like failure and success. We learned about intimacy. We learned about what it meant to be human, if, if that was even allowed. We learned about what it meant to be connected and, and, and with another person. And those, those imprints, those, those, that conditioning in our brain takes a lifetime to undo in many cases. Still at 56 years old, I have reactions to certain situations, to certain relationships, to certain feelings and others. I have relationships to all sorts of stimulus outside of me. And I have instincts. I have old patterns. Uh, my therapist calls it, I have a mother tongue. That original language to respond to failure, for example. And, and what I can be capable of most days is to slow down, to observe it. The, 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 the skill of observation is so valuable. Just look at yourself. Ram Dass said that enlightenment is essentially non-judgment of everything. Just look at it. Yes, you lashed out at, at a child or a parent. And of course, that's less than ideal in, in, in terms of their development in their life. We know that. But, but if you just regard that behavior, that misstep with judgment, there's almost no healing that comes into that, that dynamic. But instead, I get curious. I wonder why. What was I defending? What was I afraid of? What was the feeling that was driving that, that trauma response? Maybe I was scared. Maybe I didn't feel a sense of security. Maybe I was harboring some, some emotion or feeling from an earlier interaction that, that, that did or did not have anything to do with this specific situation. And if I've developed a, a base, that's what my therapist calls it. If I develop this, this foundation of self, then I can say to the person in the situation, I'm sorry, I was scared. It's not an excuse. But if I could have communicated at the moment what was authentically going on with me, I would have told you that I was scared or hurt or sad or whatever the feeling might be. So we have to understand what we're made of, how we were built. We have to go back and look at our childhood because our, our, our personality, our responses, our ideas of the world were, were dramatically shaped by experiences during, during those years. 
The work is understanding that what you were taught as a child or when you were younger was not necessarily the truth, but the function of your parents trying to figure it out in their own lives. There's no, there's no villains in this story of finding you in our process. There's no bad guys in this story. There are hurt people. There are compromised people. There are people that aren't safe. There are people that act out on us. But, but in this setting, in this context, it's not about the bad and the goodness of them. Our, our parents did the best that they could with what they had. And they are largely a product of their parents. And that goes on ad infinitum. And all we can do is take, take what we were giving and look at it critically. Peel away the things that, the ideas that they gave us, the things that we adopted to make ourselves feel safe and face the world as we are. Like I said, self-compassion, which, which stems in, in this work from compassion from another person, the idea that you pull yourself up, up by your bootstraps or that it's only about how you feel about yourself, that doesn't apply to our model. Our model is the way that you learn to care about yourself is by being cared about by somebody else. That's why stories talk about and show transformation of individuals after they were shown grace. That's why often religions talk about the grace of God. Sometimes a belief in a higher power, especially a higher power that, that has compassion, that is not a vengeful, angry, judgmental, guilt-inducing, shame-inducing God. If we have a compassionate God that, that's grounded in forgiveness, rooted in forgiveness, we can begin to develop this idea too. You know yourself. You, you know, it, it, it's like what my daughter said when the journey of the heroic parent first came out and somebody said to her, is your dad a heroic parent? She said, after thinking about it for a few seconds, well, no, he's not. But he knows he's not. And that makes him tolerable. And I cannot tell you the joy that I felt to be called tolerable by my young adult child at the time. It's about becoming conscious. And consciousness gives us choice. I have trauma responses. I have dents and wounds that I'm still healing and working on and will be, I expect, until my last breath. But I can slow down. I can see it more clearly. Every year it improves just a little bit. Through, through my therapy, through my own participation in intensives, it improves just a little bit. And, and, and slowing it down, seeing it clearly, I can begin then to make conscious choices instead of reflexive choices. Ramdas says, I can do nothing for you but work on myself. And you can do nothing for me but work on yourself. This is the work of relationships of intimacy. Finding you, finding you intensives, finding you coaching is the work of intimate relationships. I will talk about parenting when I talk about finding you all the time. And I will emphasize again that it's not because everybody who listens to me or everybody that, that could benefit from this message is a parent, but everybody that could benefit from this message was a child to parents at one point or is a child to parents still today. How does this work impact our relationships? It's like I talked about. The question of what do we do is not the right question. The right question is, who am I? What's my truth? What do I feel? What do I need? Can I tolerate this much of this or that much of this? Do I feel like a doormat? Do I feel ignored? Or can I be patient? Can I hold space? Am I taking care of myself during the day so that I have more to give my, my family in the evening when the work is done? Outside of the home, the work is done? Am I setting boundaries with my partner so that I can, I can be available to them more compassionately? The important questions are, who are you? And what is your relationship to the person or the situation that is before you? And that's arduous. By the way, it's joyful too, but it's arduous. It's painstaking. It's slow. We develop a, a, a muscle, a way of thinking. Socrates said, I can't teach the people anything. I can only teach them how to think. 
That's what this work is. That's what finding you is about. That's what these podcasts are about. Teaching us how to think. Teaching. That's why I love to do the Q&As, which I'll still keep doing. And I get asked similar questions. But for me, the process is I get asked a question. I want you to think for a moment. How would you answer the question? And then listen to how I answered and compare your answer. Was there something that I missed? Was there an aspect of the discipline of thinking about the question that I, that I skipped over or that I discarded? Ultimately, the goal is that you don't have to trust experts for advice anymore because you're the expert on your life. You know if you like going on roller coasters. You know if you want to go to a vacation in a tropical area. You know if you want to adopt a new kitten. No one can tell you what to do because this is a project about becoming yourself, not making the right decisions. Carl Jung said, or Marie Louise von Franz quoted him as saying this. She said, Jung has said that to be in a situation where there's no way out, to be in conflict where there's no solution, is the classical beginning of the process of individuation. Individuation is the process of becoming yourself. It is meant to be a situation, she says, without solution. The unconscious wants the hopeless conflict in order to put the ego consciousness up against the wall so that the man has to realize that whatever he does is wrong, whichever way he decides will be wrong. This is meant to knock out the superiority of the ego, which always acts from the illusion that it has the responsibility of the decision. In 2010, 11, and 12, when I was separated from my wife, left the, 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 the faith that I belonged to, had a falling out with my business partners, basically just failed in every major area of life. Even my relationship with my children was strained because of the separation. When I was in that spot, there was nothing left to surrender or, or, or to give up. And because I, I, I loved my children, I wasn't willing to give up. It was not a decision that, that, was, that was true and authentic to who I was. So I decided to surrender. I decided to, to, I gave up the game of being right, being good in a, in a large way. Still struggle with that all the time, of course. But, but in a large way of thinking, I gave up the game of, of being right, being good. And I'd been told, of course, that that was the thing to be in life. That's what we're told as children. Be a good citizen, be a good brother, be a good parent, be a good spouse. Be good. We're taught that 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 seems like such a simple and innocuous idea, right? To, to tell to a child. But like I quote in the in the epigraph of my book, where Jamie Gill says, "Why were each of this?" She says, "Why were each of us taught the notion of being correct when that very notion ensured our failure in the world?" See, you can't. It's not about raising good kids if you're a parent. It's about raising kids, people selves it's not about being a good spouse it's about developing the capacity to take care of yourself and to love the other person to support them in their journey along their path alan watts said whenever you when you find out that there was never anything in the dark side to be afraid of nothing is left but love this is the most magical idea that came to me in this process when I gave up trying to be good, when I, when I surrendered, when I, when I just surrendered to the, the, the utter failure that my life had become. And I realized that there was no, I had no cards to play, no moves to make in that game anymore. I just had to give up that game altogether. I became the, the, the bad one that everybody had accused me of as a child when I acted out. When I accepted that, nothing was left but love. I actually realized at that point that I'd spent, been spending my whole life up to then, to, to 42 years old, trying to be good. And because I was trying to be good, if anybody reflected back anything to me that was less than that, because of a business decision I made or a parenting interaction or an interaction with my wife, if anybody threatened that idea of being good, I would use whatever was at my disposal to make them wrong and to make me right. 
See, the idea of being good is an ego thing. It's for you, in that case, for me. And you can't really even love when you're trying to be good. Or, or maybe I should say more accurately, to the extent that, it, that the project is about being good, there is no love. To the extent the project is not about being good, you are capable of love. So I realized that that, that midlife point in my life, I'm going to give up trying to be good, and then I can love people. They can be mad at me. They can disagree with me. They can not like me. They can be hurt by me. They can be disappointed and sad. I can be connected to them because I'm not playing that game anymore. Because I give up. And that's what Alan Watts, the, the teacher of Buddhism and Eastern religions, meant when he said, when you find out that there was never anything in the dark side to be afraid of, nothing is left but love. Rumi said it like this. He said, the desire to know your own soul will end all other desires. It is a divine, transcendent, heavily experience to fall in love with yourself. It is the experience of freedom. It is the experience of heaven. It is the experience of the divine. Because when you know yourself and you've made peace with yourself and you you know you still have a, you're a wreck. You're, you're, you're grateful that anybody in your life tolerates you. Yes, you have your talents. Yes, you have your gifts. Yes, you have your, you have many things and ways of expressing yourself in beautiful ways in the universe. And you're also a human being. And we know that that comes with flaws and faults. We know that that means that in some ways that we're compromised. But when you love yourself and, and, and consequently, because you love yourself or, or show yourself self-compassion, you know yourself, you're free. Today, my, my social anxiety is reduced by a, a very large margin because I repeat the mantra, you know who you are. You've been in psychotherapy all these years. You know who you are. You, not, not just the good part, you know the bad part. So, so if they use them against you, they're not wrong. And, and you probably did step on some toes if somebody's expressing hurt. Alice Miller, excuse me, Siegel and Hartzell again from Parenting from the Inside Out, said reflecting on your childhood experiences can help you make sense of your life. Since the events of your childhood can't be altered, why is such reflection helpful? A deeper self-understanding changes who you are. That's the magic. You don't try to change who you are, you try to understand yourself, and that changes you. That is the great paradox that Carl Rogers, the master therapist, talked about. It's only when I accept myself fully that I can change. Siegel and Hartz will go on to say, making sense of your life enables you to understand others more fully and gives you the possibility of choosing your behaviors and opening your mind to a fuller range of experiences. The changes that come with self-understanding enable you to have a way of being, a way of communicating with your children that promotes their security of attachment. If you want to become a better parent, come to a Finding You. Work with Finding You. Or, or find somebody who does this kind of work. If you want to have more intimacy in, in relationship with your significant other, find you. Find your own soul. Know thyself. If you want to get, get uh, have relationships that are with your extended family, with your family of origin, with your siblings, find yourself. By the way, sometimes that finding of yourself means that you might choose to have boundaries that aren't going to be pleasant for other people. I can't talk to you. I can't engage in this dynamic with you. I don't want to be in this conversation, this relationship. And as you find yourself drawing a clear circle around yourself, a, a clear, compassionate, self-aware boundary around yourself, you will find that other people become less interested in that version of you. But some people rally. Some people fall in love with you in ways that you never experienced because you're in love with yourself. And you're being that, that bright self. And the audacity to be you, the way that I said it was, when you accept yourself, your interactions won't be with others, won't be in the service of proving your goodness and worthiness. Instead, you will use your energy for loving them. The, you know, I, I was thinking about all the various quotes that, that gird up and support this idea of finding you therapy programs. And there are so many quotes, like the Rumi quote about knowing your own soul, or many of the, the quotes from Siegel and Hartzell, or James Hollis. 
but I think this was the first one that I fell in love with from the opening page of the drama, the gifted child. And I, I, I could speak this quote in the first person as if I was saying it, but of course it's her quote. She said, experience has taught us that we have only one enduring weapon in our struggle against mental illness, the emotional discovery and emotional acceptance of the truth in the individual and unique history of our childhood. We have to understand ourselves. And to understand yourself means that you understand your roots. You understand your history. That is the enduring weapon against mental illness. It's not about getting better. It's not about not having them. It's not about erasing them. It's about sitting with them, loving them. And when you do that, of course, they heal. I read a quote this week by Rumi that I had not heard before. He said, why do you stay in prison when the door is so wide open? And I've told this story that the door that, that, that to this greater, larger life that I was seeking my whole life was always right there, but I, I couldn't see it. It didn't feel safe to, to enter, to, to open it. I assumed that everything would fall apart. The money would leave, the friends would leave, the love would leave. I thought everything would leave. And definitely there are some things that shift for sure. But that's where the freedom is. And the lie that I have believed, that you have believed, that that door is, it leads to annihilation and death and, and, and misery is just not true. It's shame and guilt that stand as sentinels guarding the door. James Hollis said, I've frequently seen people become neurotic when they consent themselves with the inadequate or wrong answers to the questions of life. That is what therapy is. It's about unlearning. Air therapy, like enlightenment, is a destructive process. It's peeling off the parts, taking off the parts, taking out the parts of ourselves that we were taught were true that aren't. Carl Jung said that there's no coming to consciousness without pain. And I wrote this. Moving forward, getting healthier is not a linear process, first of all. It's like wandering in the desert. And the great paradox is that as you move toward greater health and awareness, as you become more mentally healthy, you will feel increasing triggers of shame and guilt. You will feel guilty and shameful as you do something healthy, if it's not something you're accustomed to, not something that you are familiar with. The thing that stands in the way of that door, of me going toward that wide open door, are guilt and shame. You've changed. You seem so selfish. I can't believe you're abandoning us. What crazy ideas do you have? Those are the, the fates that whisper in our ear, that tell us that we're not who we are. I think people come to therapy for some kind of hack often. They want some way around the pain. They want a winning solution or a formula. They want a spell that they can cast to change others and the world around them. But psychotherapy at finding you is different. Psychotherapy at finding you is the project of building a sense of self. And with this sense of self, one is able to go through the pain, to lose, to surrender. And on the other side of this destructive process, the person begins to build the life that they were meant to be living. If, for example, we are unclear about what we feel, think, believe in value, we cannot be confident whether what we see in another person is our projection. You, you, you know yourself so that you can know others. If you don't know yourself, you can't know others. You don't know what is your projection. You don't know what ideas, what, what, what concepts are clouding your vision. You have judgments that stem from the indoctrination and the conditioning of your own childhood. Parents have told me this. They've said to me, I think my child likes to play soccer, but I wonder if she's just doing that to please me. Nobody can be too sure of that. I've had children tell me my parents made me play soccer or made me try out for theater or made me get straight A's. Maybe they used coercion and behavioral tactics for that. But oftentimes it was just this idea that the child thought that it was their job to make the parent happy. And they experienced this 
this this feeling this 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 com this compelling feeling to please the parents as an as an edict as a mandate as an imperative that, that they must fulfill we have to learn to individuate to resist the gravitational pull of others if we are to remain clear about our, ourselves and our own truth that's why i go back to therapy that's why the finding you intensives repeat themselves that's why i go back to my own intensive i go to therapy i go to my people my safe people my safe contexts right my safe containers i go there to reconnect to myself to find myself over and over again. When a certain master was asked once, how are we to treat others? He answered, there are no others. Once you get in touch with yourself, I, see, I saw this in the treatment program that I ran for years. Once you start to see yourself more clearly, you see yourself in everybody. Oftentimes early in treatment, the, the clients would say, well, I'm different than them. I don't." do drugs or I don't, I'm not aggressive toward my parents or whatever the difference was that they, they tried to use to keep themselves separate. But after some powerful and deep therapy, weeks into the process, they would say, yes, I didn't steal. I wasn't aggressive. Yes, I didn't do drugs or, or, or my, you know, my drug was my anger. I didn't, I didn't medicate with drugs. I medicated with food or cutting on myself and we're the same charles eisenstein said he talked about in his book the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible he said interbeing he called it interbeing interbeing is this this idea that there are no others it's something that we can feel why does it hurt when we hear another person coming to harm he asks why when we read of the mass die-offs of the coral reefs and see their bleached skeletons do we feel like we've sustained a blow it is because it is literally happening to ourselves, to our extended self. You see how this work breeds compassion? It, it, it is, he said in his book, this idea of self-compassion is the most radical form of protest in the world. It is what it means to be an activist, to radically love yourself. We have to find new answers to life's most important questions like, what is love? We have to take back our project projections. That's what happens in marriage. You get married because of all the projections. This person is going to save your life and you're going to save theirs and you're going to rescue them from their family of origin dilemma and they're going to rescue you from your insecurities. All those projections, all that pressure, that, that idea that we're going to avoid the principal responsibility of living our life. If you do not do the work of to, to learn to love your horrible, rotten self, the parts of yourself that you have discarded, that you were told were unacceptable, you'll project those aspects out onto others. You will think that the problems in your life are the fault of others. You will see the badness, the enemies out there. The work is to own your feelings, own the parts of yourself that work against you. You must reclaim the parts you split off, you discarded, you ignored, you repressed in order to survive. While this process can be painful and absolutely is terrifying, on the other side of it, there is hope. There's liberation and freedom and, of course, most importantly, a greater love. We have to take back our projections to do this work. A projection is a defense mechanism where a person unconsciously takes the split off parts of them, splits off parts of themselves. I'm not selfish. I'm not angry. I'm not a sexual person. Whatever the idea is that we were told or taught, mostly non-verbally or unacceptable. Some of them, of course, were set very overtly. We deny the split off parts of, his or, of ourselves, our own attributes, our thoughts and emotions. And we ascribe them to the outside world. We project them onto the others. Thus, projection involves imagining or projecting the belief that others originate those feelings. Projection, of course, reduces anxiety by allowing the expression of the unwanted, unconscious impulses or desires without letting the conscious mind recognize them. We see the villains. We see the enemies out there. We blame. We otherize. And, of course, this therapeutic process 
when you accept yourself, when you reclaim that part, when you realize like I did when we separated, it's not my job to make my wife happy. That's her job. And it's not her job to make me happy. That's my job. When we both started to subscribe to this, this new idea of what intimacy and love and marriage was, our interactions won't be to try to make ourselves good. Our interactions were then, we had the energy available. Once I gave up the idea of being good, I had all this excess energy that, that was available that I was using for the defenses. And I use it to love and serve others. We can't have the conversation about connection without talking about boundaries because boundaries allow for connection. Otherwise, the relationship is compromised. It's comprised of two compromised people and lacks the initial ingredient of intimacy. We have to be ourselves to be in relationship. Otherwise, we're a lie. We're a partial self. Codependency, a very popular term, of course, refers to a misguided concept of what it means to be a person and to love another person. Codependency is, for most people, what they were taught about love. Codependency is when we try to change the things outside of us. When we make the problem external to us. We think that the problem is out there and we try to fix out there in our child, in our spouse, in our friend, in the world. And if I can just change that, then I will be at peace. We try to solve an inside problem, which is a lack of peace and serenity and clarity and self-love. We try to solve that issue by changing and controlling others. As my daughter Emma Reedy June explained, codependency is the illusion that you're doing something for something somebody else when you're really doing it for yourself. And I wrote in the Audacity BU, it's common to conflate loving too much. I hear this euphemism. Well, people just love too much. I'm not codependent. I just love too much. I'm not anxious. I just love too much. See, see how the person has to deny what they are? And they create this, this, this illusion of what they are to, to, to preserve that idea that they're good and lovable. All the while, their, their behavior and interactions are hurting the other person. So I wrote, it's common to conflate love or loving too much with anxious attachment. Loving too much is a euphemism for the unhealed attachment wound and its expression in an anxious parent or partner. The problem is not loving too much, but rather not enough self. And I just want to comment, if you're watching live, that's a picture of my daughter, Emma Reedy June, and her mother, my, my ex-wife, my first wife. I love that picture. I have this cartoon that I got permission to use in the journey of the heroic parent on the, the three stages of self-awareness or enlightenment. And the first frame of the cartoon, the silly cartoon, there are two chickens standing there. And the first chicken says to the second chicken, you're an idiot. And the second ch chicken exclaims, no. As the cartoon progresses in the second frame, the first chicken says, you're an idiot. And the second chicken says, yes. And in the final and third frame of the cartoon, the second chicken just admits, I'm an idiot. That's what it means to come to awareness, to enlightenment. You have to fail, usually. It's hard to do this work if everything is a success. That's why narcissists are so hard to reach sometimes because they have all, all these gifts that prevent them from failing. They get uh, uh, an advanced education. They make a lot of money. They might be very attractive by the world standards in, in many ways. And that's a hard place to find this kind of enlightenment. But fail, experience the, the, the humiliations that the analysts describe as the pathway towards self-awareness, and everything opens up for you. Another one of those quotes that I just love and is a core part of it is, Carl Jung's quote, knowing your own darkness is the best method for dealing with the darkness of others. So at finding you and finding you intensives, finding you coaching and the classes that we offer, the work is really based on developing a better relationship with yourself. And we do that by developing a, an environment. If it's at one of our multi-day intensives or, or family or couples intensives, we do it by creating safety. I shared some quotes this week and what people said to me was the thing on multiple occasions, the thing that I got most out of my finding you experience was what it looked like, what it sounded like 
to, to provide somebody with compassion and non-judgment, no advice, no solutions, just to witness what was going on for them. I've had people that have, I have one person that I'm thinking in particular who has made their life as a social media influencer and writer uh, about compassion and love. And the same person said they never felt it so profoundly as sitting in a finding you, you workshop, a finding you intensive. All right. As always, my two books, The Journey of the Heroic Parent and The Audacity Be You, both of which were quoted in, in this broadcast, are available on Amazon and Audible. You can use the QR code there if you're watching if you're watching live. For everybody, anything finding you for now, for today, you can email us at drbradreedy at gmail.com, D-R-B-R-A-D-R-E-E-D-Y at gmail.com, or go to our, our, our website, our temporary website, which is my website, bradreedy.com or drbradreedy.com. Both of those work, actually. We're going to be having a webinar subscription. For the first couple of these, if you are, uh, if you are a former client or alumni of my previous program, Evoke Therapy Programs, you'll be automatically included in the invites. But eventually in the coming weeks, uh, the, the live broadcasts are going to be by subscription. We tried to find a price that we felt was reasonable. We're, we'll be doing five or six of these a, a, a month. So for six months, for a six month subscription, it'll be $150. And of course, the podcasts are free. The rebroadcast, the audio podcasts are free. You can find those in the same place. I've had so many people reach out to me and say, where do I find the new podcast? Well, You'll be listening to this in the same spot. So if you're listening to this, you know exactly where to find it. Our first Finding You Intensive under the Finding You Therapy Programs umbrella is October 23rd through 27th. Sign up quickly if you'd like to get a spot there. November, we will be doing an online Finding You, November 15th through 17th. It's about a third of the price, half the time, and you can do it from the comfort of your own home. And then in December, we'll be having our second Finding You in-person intensive. That is December 4th through 8th. I think it's perfectly positioned in the holiday uh, at a time when all of us need a greater dose of self-compassion, a greater dose of self-awareness. December 4th through 8th, Finding You Intensive. Those will both be hosted in Utah. I'm also going to be announcing our attachment-based therapy class, a master class. We had several of those last year, and, and, and I love doing them. Got a lot of good feedback. We'll be launching the Conscious Parenting Workshop, which is an all-day workshop. And of course, online finding you dates will come out more and more. Thanks for joining me for the first broadcast of the finding you. You might not think it's the first, it might not feel like the first because it's still me. It's still finding you. But of course, this is our new venture. My next broadcast, my next podcast recording will be a Q and a this Thursday, October 3rd at 6 PM. It's been several weeks since I've entertained a Q and a, so I'm looking forward to that. Send in questions. If you're listening or if you're watching, send in questions to that email, drbradreedy at gmail.com to so that I have them in advance. And of course, you can submit them live if you're watching live. But if you're not watching live or you're not an alumni, or you don't have a subscription, then you can um, email me at drbradreedy at gmail.com. You can also go to our website, like I said, drbradreedy.com to see our programming and what we're going to be doing. And our new website will be launched here in the next week or so. Thanks for joining me, as always. For, for on behalf of the people that you love and the people that love you, thanks for doing your work to love your horrible, rotten self. That makes all the difference in the world. Thanks for showing up. Have a great evening, and I'll talk to you Thursday night. Take care. Bye-bye.